ordinea programului. Am să dau cuvântul domnului Alexandru Gabriel Cioiu. Ah, ok, uh, sunt eu. Ah, okay. Așa. Scuze, Doctorand în cadrul Centrului de Etică Aplicată a Facultății de Filozofie a Universității din București. Uh, lucrarea dumnealui are tema Is Freedom Comparable with Moral Neuroenhancement? O lucrare foarte interesantă pe care abia așteptăm să auzim. Domnule Cioiu, yes. Alexandru. Thank you very much. So first I would like to uh, be sure that everyone hears me correctly because it's the first time that I that I use Zoom and I don't know if I do if everything is correct. Like if everyone can hear me. Uh, can everyone hear me right or Yes. 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 Okay, okay, thank you. I was just making sure. Yes, so today I'm going to talk about the <clears throat> relation between freedom and moral neuroenhancement. Um, I would like to uh, start from the relation between these two concepts because <clears throat> uh, in the past two decades, uh, new, new discoveries in the field of uh, genetics and ne neurobiology um, have made more appealing this idea of moral neuroenhancement or moral bioenhancement. Um, so this is a very wide term which has been defined in many ways by different authors. There are, uh, they are, they are more critics than promoters of this idea because it's a, it's a new team, it's a new concept in the field of bioethics. But the main idea is that uh, a moral bioenhancement or neuroenhancement is any kind of state uh, which, <coughs> which can be... Um, which, uh, which can result in, a, in the agent being a morally better person with the aid of different neuro neurotechnologies. Uh, for example, pharmaceutical drugs or transcranial brain current uh, direct brain stimulation or neurofeedback enhancement, or it's usually uh, limited to, the, to this uh, non-invasive technique the techniques of enhancement. So it's not something that would uh, turn us into, I don't know, robots who need to behave in a certain way. It's not mind control like some people are trying to claim. Uh, <clears throat> so there are many authors who think that this, this kind of methods of bio biomedical methods can re undermine our notion of freedom or restrict our freedom to commit immoral acts, for example, by, yeah, by uh, making, it, making us uh, like behave in a compulsive manner, uh, like without considering the reasons that we have for behaving in a moral way, which would eliminate uh, freedom and in this way would eliminate the, the agent's moral responsibility because uh, moral responsibility pre presupposes freedom. So this, these two uh, concepts are very intertwined. <clears throat> now, my idea is that uh, we shouldn't be worrying about uh, the methods of uh, bioenhancement restricted, restricting freedom because um, for example, one of the fathers of the, of the moral bioenhancement process is Thomas Douglas. And he says that there are two counter moral emotions. For example, a strong aversion to, um, to uh, racial, um, to, to, to racism, uh, or for example, the impulse, um, a strong aversion to certain racial groups and uh, the impulse towards violent aggression. These are two features of human psychology that we have, um, we have, um, we have from our ancestors, which used to live like in tribes. And this moral psychology has um, transferred into our modern context. And we, we can see this, that there, that, even today, these uh, two features are very widespread in the world. You have, we have racist problems everywhere in the world, every, even in, in the most developed countries. For example, if we look at uh, the US, for example, uh, and even the, the violent behavior, behavior it's even more, um, more of an issue because it's like still widespread in the 21st century. And he says that we have these methods that we can reduce these destructive impulses or um, like 
genetic predisposition towards aggression or towards racism. And we have certain methods for this. For example, there are studies showing that the oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter, is also uh, called like moral molecule or the cuddle hormone. It has been shown that um, if it is uh, administered via, via nasal spray, it can enhance the empathy of the persons or the trust or the cooperation between individuals. Uh, and it can make people more predisposed into acting uh, in a moral way. For example, in donating to charity or in saving uh, an animal that we see on the street starving. We are more, if we take this substance, we are, um, we are more inclined to help that animal or, or to donate to charity. Another example is the, the use of serotonin, which is another neurotransmitter, and it has been shown in several economics game that it can in, uh, increase the, uh, the sense of fairness of people. So people, after taking this substance, they seem to be more fair. It's a moral disposition, very important in moral philosophy. And also it has been shown to, uh, also serotonin, to, is, it's used for, the, for treating depressed moods. It can alleviate certain states of depression. And our, these kind of stands are also very important for our moral behavior, because if we have a depressed mood, maybe we are not so inclined to behave in a moral way maybe we lack the motivation to do what we know it's right we <clears throat> we know maybe it's right to good to to i don't know to to donate to charity for example to give the same example but if we have a depressed move maybe we are not so inclined to donate and yes so also the the use of lithium which is a substance known for um, also for reducing aggression it's known for over 70 year, years for example, in the in the 1950s in the in uh, America, the Seven Up company, which made um, makes juice, it used to add a little bit of lithium in the drinks. So it has been shown that it can reduce aggression in in certain in certain people, especially in prisoners in in um, that have violent behavior and. <clears throat> Um, there are some experiments in prisons showing this uh, this idea, and yes, so there are many authors that criticize this uh, this kind of approach to morality. They say that it might make us uh, to behave in a compulsive manner without thinking about the reasons we have to behave in that manner. But I wouldn't say that this is so because first they are uh, very safe techniques, so they don't have side effects. Uh, they are not invasive because they don't uh, invade our intimacy or I don't know, they, they do not uh, restrict our autonom autonomy. Because if, if, we take the, if we take the examples of women, women, they, there are many uh, studies who are showing that women are more empathetic and less aggressive than men. So because they are like this, they, are, they tend to be more moral than men, but we don't consider women to be less free because they're more moral than men. So the idea would be, would be to make men more moral like women, and this wouldn't mean that they are less free because a moral person, he has, he is actually less, uh, more free than an immoral person because he has, he can control better his uh, emotions and his impulses. For example, if we take the people who are addicted to nicotine, who are smoking, and they want to, to give up smoking, but they cannot give up smoking because they have this genetic uh, addiction to nicotine. So we will use biomedical treatment to help them um, sur surpass this uh, genetic urge so they can qu quit smoking easier. So it is not magic here. It's just we, we know the laws of our behavior and we use biomedical treatment to make, a, make us more uh, predisposed to act in the way that we already consider to be moral. So it's not some, someone who is uh, mind, uh, mind controlling us or uh, I don't know, uh, like in the clockwork, clockwork orange, like just to restrict our uh, freedom to act in a certain way. No, it's ju it just gives us better reasons and more motivation to um, to act in the in the way that we already consider to be more. So, 
it's not uh, is nothing magic or uh, de destructive it wouldn't turn us into mindless robots and i actually think it's very good to 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 take this this i'm i'm specifically referring to these means which are very which are tested are safe are non invasive i think they can rather ex expand our freedom than reduce it because it will it, it would expand our moral sensitivity and a person with moral sensitivity can see more nuances and can see more um, more options where the the moral person doesn't see. He can see only in black and white. Also Thank you very this. much for your presentation, yeah. Mr. Treyu. Of I will now uh, pass the floor to Mr. Prabhu Wancha, PhD in uh, Interdisciplinary School of Doctoral Studies, University of Bucharest, Romania. Uh, with a speech on living communist history in the living room, the case of the communist consumer museum in Timisoara, Romania, between nostalgia and entrepreneurship project. Mr. Wanja. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I okay. can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to make sure. Okay. So, uh, as you can see from the video presentation I made. Uh, 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 and history in the first part of the presentation. I will leave this aside for today because of the format of the presentation and also because I want to give you more context of this very interesting case study of the uh, Communist Consumer Museum in, in 2015. It was uh, arguably the first such project in Romania uh, because it was a private initiative. Uh, and uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Okay. Because it was the history of communism in Romania. And at the same time, it was also a way to make money, even though uh, it was an indirect uh, means to make uh, to gain finances, uh, because this museum project of the uh, collective that uh, eventually uh, set up the museum was a uh, alternative theater which was called Aoleu, Oh My, a very loose translation in English, in 2005, and it started out in a garage. It was it had a more of a theater or intimate stage, also much more interaction between uh, the public and uh, the actors. Uh, and in 2009, the collective uh, had this opportunity to move the theater in uh, an old interwar villa in the problem was that they also needed some finances in order to support their uh, alternative theater. So what they did was uh, they came up with the idea of a bar again with a very funny name in Romanian skirts loc leger skirts would be the let's say the sound would be loosely translated as chill or loose place so the idea was that they uh, they just copied a western model where a theater was joined by a bar where people could come watch uh, a play and also So consume and have a drink or have a snack. Uh, most of the people who were involved in this collective uh, were also passionate collectors and they started gathering a lot of artifacts from the 1960s and 1970s and most of these artifacts turned out to be from communist Romania. So uh, it was that uh, a lot of the members of this collective were not just uh, actors or entrepreneurs but they're also passionate collectors of old artifacts. And uh, most of the items they collected from secondhand fairs, from uh, uh, acquaintances, from relatives, were artifacts from the communist era. So at a certain point, there was this problem of what to do with all these artifacts. And they came up with the idea to turn all this burden into a means, not necessarily to make money, but to gain a lot of publicity for their uh, Communist Consumer Museum came about. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so this is how the idea of this uh, uh, Communist Consumer Museum came about. 
they used the basement of the villa and they turned it into a very ironic communist apartment with a kitchen, with a bathroom, where they stored all these items. Uh, I uh, mentioned that it is uh, an ironic communist apartment in a way because it is also very crowded. One gets around uh, in very difficult uh, uh, in that basement. And I mentioned that they don't make money directly from the museum because the entrance is uh, free. You don't have to pay any fee for it. But at the same time, in terms of uh, publicity and PR, this museum uh, pretty much put the, both the theater, Aulau, and the bar uh, on an almost uh, regional map. So beyond Timisoara and even beyond Romania. So a lot of tourists that came to visit Timisoara uh, also visited the museum and also became aware of the theater, also uh, bought snacks and drinks in, in, uh, in the bar. So from this point of view, it is a very interesting project because it combines this uh, attitude towards communism, which is much more private, much more personal. It is not state funded, uh, state supported. It is not ideological. Uh, it is a personal nostalgia for a past that most of the people in the collective uh, never uh, lived. Uh, one of them whom uh, I interviewed last year was only uh, nine years old when uh, the communist regime fell. Uh, with uh, a very innovative and a very effective, I would say, uh, project of uh, entrepreneurship, so idea to, to make money. And uh, the consequences uh, go beyond uh, entrepreneurship studies or museum studies because uh, with such uh, uh, private initiatives, we also gain a sort of democratization of the way we regard uh, the communist past in general and also uh, our own private past. So I will stop here for now and thank you very much and I look forward to your questions either in this session or, or via email if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wancha, for your very interesting presentation. I will now uh, move the microphone to Mrs. Luana Bogian, who I believe is representing uh, also her colleague, uh, Mrs. Venera Mihaela Kozokariu. Together, they have registered for this conference a paper entitled Urban Rural Resistance, a relevant factor in, manifesta in manifesting intercultural sensitivity. Um, they are uh, representatives of Vasile Alexandri University of Baco from Romania. Mrs. Zoana Bogdan, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Professor Kojokariu is also in this meeting. So, of course. Uh, uh, so, uh, Professor Kojokariu and uh, Mrs. Zoana Bogdan, uh, please together present your paper. Yes. Thank you. Um, we would like to share uh, our screen. Oh, okay. So uh, our uh, our paper is um, is entitled "Urban uh, Rural Workplace." Uh, we we changed a little bit the title. The the first title uh, was about residents, but we we actually did the study on urban rural workplace and how this uh, background um, impacts uh, the the level of intercultural sensitivity at teachers uh, so we worked with uh, one general hypothesis and several specific hypotheses um intercultural sensitivity is defined as um, the ability to build a positive emotion towards understanding and appreciating cultural differences and we believe that in the, in today's context teachers and not only need to have this uh, high level of uh, intercultural uh, sensitivity um as a methodology we applied um questionnaire, uh, the intercultural sensitivity scale, adapt uh, 24 item Likert scale with five answer options adapted uh, after Chen and Starosta's intercultural scale. Uh, and we applied it to 103 respondents 
uh, teachers working in rural uh, environment and 103 respondents, uh, namely teachers working in urban schools. As a general hypothesis, um, we formulated that the workplace environment, urban or rural, impacts the, le uh, the level of manifesting intercultural sensitivity. And the specific hypotheses are connected to um, the five sub-skills of the intercultural uh, sensitivity scale. The questionnaire comprises um, five sub-skills uh, or dimensions. For example, the desire to interact in a constructive manner. And each sub-skill has um, a certain number of items in the questionnaire. Uh, the number of items ranges from two to six. Uh, so for, um, for example, for specific hypothesis number one, the desire to interact in a constructive manner displays higher levels at urban working uh, residents. Uh, we found that um, it was validated and uh, except for one item uh, of this subscale, uh, for example, urban working uh, teachers are more open to people from different cultures. Uh, they, um, um, when interacting with people from different cultures, they are very open and um, do their best to show them that they understand them. However, the rural working uh, teachers uh, were found to have um, to be more to give more positive answers while talking to a person from another culture. Uh, regarding the specific hypothesis number two, uh, respect for cultural differences and diversity is higher at urban background, urban uh, working. Um, So, um, uh, so uh, respect for cultural differences was and diversity was found uh, to to have higher scores at urban working um, teachers. Um, the following uh, hypothesis uh, concerns confidence in interactions with people from other cultures. Um, it was found that. Um, Teachers working in rural environments show higher levels of respect for um, uh, of uh, confidence in interacting uh, with people from other cultures. Uh, the specific hypothesis now. So the pleasure derived from interacting with people from other cultures. And um, we found that the urban working teachers have higher levels of um, uh, pleasure produced by interact interactions with people from different cultures. Uh, the specific hypothesis number five uh, is concerned with attention paid to interaction. Um, and um, the data also revealed higher levels at urban working teachers. So teachers from the urban environment tend to pay more attention to when uh, interacting with um, people from other, from uh, culturally different environments. Uh, the, the specific hypothesis uh, number six concerning the avoidance of labels, stereotypes and prejudices. Uh, regarding this, um, this subscale, our data, the rural working teachers are um, avoid more often uh, labeling, stereotyping, and um, uh, manifesting prejudices. Um, Regarding the general hypothesis, uh, the um, 
whether the urban or rural working background impacts the, the levels of intercultural sensitivity. It was found that this was validated. It was found that um, urban working teachers display on the overall a uh, higher level of intercultural sensitivity. Um, our study also wanted to, to show that it is necessary to, to conduct uh, studies on um, thank you on um, urban uh, versus rural uh, teaching contexts so as to include um, to, to design and uh, include um, educational policies referring to both rural and urban backgrounds because uh, there are differences concerning uh, the education conducted in these two um, backgrounds. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bogyan. Now we are open for questions and interventions, please. Yes, Ana Fonza. Hi to you all. Uh, nice to meet you all here. I um, I would have some comments or questions or doubts on the Alexandru um, Chuoyu's paper. It's a quite challenging paper and um, while I was listening to him, I was thinking about the nature of the individual um, and my, my principal concerns refers to the um, uh, the fact that why is that uh, so necessarily a call for morality of the individual as long morality is uh, goes to to limit the aut authenticity of the the person uh, to whom's good is considered such such an uh, an enhancement the public good or the person the individual's good well i think that <clears throat> the main good would be the public good because we have so many challenges in the global context that we're living today for example uh, we live in a in a context which is has been unprecedented in the history of humankind for example we have global warming which is it's a very it's a very uh, extreme and important matter and in the end it can be seen as a moral uh, moral issue it's because of us because us, we people have created the global warming we have it is an, a natural phenomenon but we have intensified it so much that now it threatens to like wipe us out so of course if everyone would um, reduce his pollution his carbon footprint for example we wouldn't have this issue with global warming if uh, factory farms would not work in the way that they work today, that they pollute massively and they uh, contribute uh, negatively to the global warming, we wouldn't deal with, we, we wouldn't have to deal with these issues. So a moral, uh, <clears throat> a moral enhancement would, uh, would have in, in, uh, in mind uh, the idea of public good, like for example, alleviating global warming or bioterrorism now it's it's very easy for a people for a person to read some stuff on the internet and create a biological weapon in, in his garage for example and throw it Could away you please, wherever you want. thank yeah? you could you please resume what this neuro enhancement moral neuro enhancement means from from your side well from my side uh, with the current methods of biomedical treatment it, it's a very modest role it can only give you some reasons to behave more morally for example to you take some substance oxytocin serotonin or you do the transcranial okay. direct okay current. just just one i understand it so yeah. there are some um, a bit invasive techniques to go uh, to be um, to become moral okay but uh, what about reasoning? Why could not reasoning be the, the shift that the, um, uh, the humankind could uh, go to? Not to consume uh, other chemical um, um, well, substances, but, but to, to appeal to their own reason. 
Well, I think that's uh, quite uncontroversial. If you look at the history of moral philosophy from the uh, from the day of um, moral teachers such as uh, Buddha, Jesus, or Confucius, or yeah, people from that period until today, if you put the moral progress in balance with uh, technological progress, you can see that there is a very, very high uh, difference. Like we have created so so much technological um, advancement like we can we have created weapon of mass destruction that can completely erase human life in a matter of days but the moral progress the moral psychology is uh, is similar to to our ancestors for living in tribes in caves they were hunter gatherers they were killing each other so we have that moral psychology from like okay. 5000 years ago <clears throat> So and there is no room for reasoning. It's time to intervene with chemical weapons, like. No, no. It, there is a, a time. We we have also the um, techniques of cognitive enhancement. Uh, of course, we have to enhance also the the intelligence, the memory, the mental mental cognition. But uh, by, there is a very wide space between knowing what is right and doing the right. So. Thank you. The problem of acrasia. The lack of motivation to do what is right. Yeah. Thank you. I also ask you a question. Um, I see that you are a, a very high supporter of biomoral enhancement. And uh, during your presentation, you said that biomoral enhancement um, means techniques that are not controversial because they are non invasive. Mm. According to uh, Scientific literature, biomoral enhancement is also about invasive techniques. It is also about uh, creating a link between the human mind and the artificial intelligence. Mm. It is also about genetically engineering people to uh, be predisposed to, certain, to a certain genetic type of behavior. So I was just uh, wondering, from your point of view, how do you... Um, see this problem of the opposite opposites in one place you have the theory of soft power that theory says that um, biomoral enhancement is not naturally uh, automatically a direct mixture mixture in the autonomy of the person but actually it creates a predisposition genetically for that person to um, be part of some kind of a race of slaves for the people who control genetically the enhancements of that person. So this is one theory. And on the other side, we have Parsons and Savulescu who say, uh, regarding what you and uh, Mrs. Anna Ponce were talking about, who say that humanity has made a terrible uh, leap in uh, technology, but it hasn't made the same leap morally. Therefore, mm -hmm there is uh, an, a real obligation for human beings to get to bio-enhance the future generations. So on the one side you have soft power theory, on the other side you have um, the mandatory bio-moral enhancement that Parsons and Savulescu uh, yeah. say we need to do. How do you feel about these two theories? Because these are the extremes. Yes, uh, so the the main debate is between bioconservatives who think that um, modifying uh, genetically the human being alters the human nature and the other side is the transhumanists or posthumanists who consider that uh, such enhancement is desirable because it would result in us being better moral persons. Me, of course, I'm on this, the other side, on the tra transhumanist side, uh, because I think we, there is a, a a large aversion against biomedical uh, treatment is uh, it's an irrational aversion if you want there is this um, psych uh, psychological uh, bias which is called the uh, statu quo bias which claims that we have a, we have an, an irrational aversion to any kind of uh, biomedical treatment because it would it would change the statu quo i believe uh, we have 30 seconds left yes okay, so the idea is that we have this aversion which is innate to any kind of change that would alter the human genome, but I think is misguided because altering human biology might turn out to be a 
better in the long range and expanding our freedom and morality. Thank you very much for participating, to all participants. I, I love Zoom because it doesn't let us go beyond this scheduled session, which we can do when we meet real life. Uh, I can't wait for this pandemic to end and to have the new face-to-face -face conferences as we know them, where we can debate. Thank you very much for your presence. And in about five minutes, we will see each other in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. All right.